morning, everyone. So the next time I come, there's coffee out here before service. So when you say good morning, that way you're awake and you go, good morning, Dennis. There we go. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, It was wonderful to be able to share my testimony uh, this morning at the uh, Sunday School. Um, Of course, some of you are here again after the Sunday School. Some of you are here just uh, for the service. I just want to briefly mention uh, what Pastor Greg talked about, about this brochure. Um, About a year and a half ago, the Lord called my wife and I to move back to Israel. And we're actually moving back in one month on October 25th uh, of this year. We notified our congregation a year and a half, our elders a year and a half ago. We notified our congregation uh, a year ago. We're going to be um, pastoring the staff of Chosen People Ministries in Israel. The staff now is 23 people. We're also going to be doing marriage counseling and also discipling uh, young men and women along with other uh, evangelistic programs. We had a daunting task of replacing the income that our congregation was giving us for the past 12 years. And the Lord is good. Amen. And the, the $6,000 a month that we had to replace, at this point, we are only $500 a month short. Uh, another $500 a month from precious brothers and sisters like you will help us uh, to absolutely even the scales financially uh, as we make our way back to Israel. By the way, our youngest son, Sam, is currently living there. Uh, he is uh, in the IDF, the Israeli uh, Defense Force. So this is a brochure both about our ministry. It's a beautiful picture of my wife, Tina, here. Uh, it's also uh, a little bit about the history uh, of Chosen People Ministries, uh, our beginnings, our purpose, uh, opportunities for uh, volunteer work, Uh, And then, as Pastor said, there's a tear-off here. It goes like this. I love that sound. Anyway, you can become a partner with us in the ministry, whether it's a partner in prayer or a partner financially. Uh, I would ask that you fill one of these out. They're on the table in the foyer. Uh, Fill one of these out before you leave. Um, Name, address, email address. Please print legibly uh, so that we get the mail to the right mailbox and the emails to the right inbox. Uh, And then if you'll give this back to me before you leave, I would like to thank you uh, with a gift. And the gift is a book called Isaiah 53 Explained. It's an amazing book. It's the uh, best written material our ministry has ever produced in terms of witnessing the gospel to the Jewish people. And so I know that there are a number of people here at the Valley Church uh, who are currently on our mailing list, who are currently uh, partners with us in prayer and or, min- and or financially, uh, but I would love to see more. So please, get one of the brochures in the back, fill it out, and uh, I'd love to give you that book uh, as a gift. Okay, so much for the uh, advertisement, but thank you for mentioning it. So... Um, The topic I was supposed to speak on uh, was the Jewishness of Christmas. Problem is, Christmas isn't for a couple months. And as a matter of fact, I talked to Pastor. I said, is it all right if I change the topic? Why? Um, Because tonight at sundown begins the holiest day of the year for Jewish people. It's called in Hebrew, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. And I think it would be very apropos today Uh, for me to give you a little history, a little background, a little understanding of what that day is, not just to the Jewish people, uh, but also to believers all over uh, the world. You see, the the Day of Atonement was fulfilled by Jesus at his first coming when he atoned for our sins through his shed blood. But it will also be fulfilled in the future. It will be fulfilled further at his second coming, when, he rec- when Israel, in fact, recognizes him uh, as their Messiah. Let me give you some historical background. Uh, take a brief moment to review and to put this Day of Atonement in its proper context. As you go through Leviticus 23, there are a total of seven feasts that the Lord gave to his people uh, to observe. 
Now, the feasts are broken down into three main seasons. There are the spring feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. And they coincide with the barley harvest, and they were fulfilled by Jesus at his first coming. The Feast of Weeks coincided with the completion of the wheat harvest. That completion, by the way, you know as Pentecost. And it was fulfilled by Jesus' giving of the Holy Spirit, which, as you know in church history, inaugurated the church age uh, in which we now live. Now, the church age um, simply represents an interlude, if you will, in God's direct dealings with Israel. Uh, and it's a period uh, that is also known as the time of the Gentiles. God is using this time to make Israel jealous, jealous in preparation for the time when she will repent and recognize Jesus as the Messiah and be restored. Now, the final three feasts, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, which starts tonight at sundown, and the Feast of Tabernacles, they all occur in the fall. And I believe that they will be fulfilled in full by our Messiah Jesus at his second coming. The Feast of Trumpets will literally be fulfilled by Jesus when he returns to this earth accompanied by a loud trumpet blast. And tonight... I want to move on to the second of the fall feasts, that being the Day of Atonement. As with all the feasts, we find the primary instructions for this holy day and for the observance of the holy day in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23. I'm going to be reading now from Leviticus 23, verses 26 to 30. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month of Av, beginning in the evening, on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, which is today, from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. Now, before I go on any further, uh, I need to take a moment, uh, if you will, to define the word atonement. You know, it's one of those um, religious terms uh, that we use quite easily, we use quite frequently, uh, but maybe we use it and we refer to it without completely understanding uh, its meaning. Now, in Hebrew, the Day of Atonement is known as Yom Kippur. And the Hebrew word Kippur, which is usually translated in English as atonement, well, it comes from a Hebrew word which means to cover or to seal. And there are two crucial aspects, I think, to this concept of atonement. One. It is the provision of a covering or a sealing or a satisfaction for sin. And second, it provides reconciliation between two parties that have been estranged. And in fact, these two aspects have their genesis, their beginning, well, actually, in the book of Genesis. All the way back in chapter 3, in the account of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden, they discovered they had sinned against God. Then they tried to hide from God. And furthermore, they tried to cover their shame with fig leaves. The problem was that was not adequate to cover their sin. And so God graciously provided a proper covering. Well, how did he do that? Well, he did it by taking the skins of an innocent, sacrificial 
animal. That's in chapter 3 and verse 21. You see, by God's covering, Adam and Eve's sin was atoned for and their fellowship with God was reconciled, although not fully reconciled as we read through the rest of Scripture. And as a sidebar, too, with Moses, while he was a prince in Egypt, do you remember when he killed an Egyptian taskmaster? You remember that story? Well, Moses tried to cover the act by hiding the body, the dead body, in the sand. But it wasn't sufficient to hide Moses' crime. All this is a, a reminder that all of our sins, whether against God or man, are never, ever hidden. So, here's how we arrived at the word atonement. When William Tyndale was working on his English translation of the Bible, this would be way back in the early 1500s, he literally couldn't find an English word that adequately conveyed both of those ideas, covering and reconciliation. And so he coined a brand new word, literally, at one meant. At one meant. Atonement. It's a word that describes how we are to be made one with God through this process. And in a broad sense, atonement actually describes the overarching theme of, of the whole of Scripture, the reconciliation of God and man through Jesus the Messiah. You see, Jesus both covers or satisfies our sins, and he also reconciles us to the Creator God. Now, this Day of Atonement occurs on the 10th day of the month of Tishrei. Uh, and if you're not taking notes, pastor's going to have a quiz next Sunday. Are you, when I tell a joke, you've got to laugh, or I'm going to tell it twice. Okay. <laughs> it will begin at sunset tonight, and it concludes tomorrow night also at sunset. So this day concludes what we call a 10-day period that begins on Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets. It's known as the High Holy Days, or in Hebrew, Yamim Noraim, the Days of Awe and Repentance. And so this feast, this holy day, this holiday of Yom Kippur that begins tonight at sundown is considered Israel's most solemn holy day. And as with all the other feasts, there are additional instructions regarding the observance of the feast elsewhere in the scriptures. In this case, the instructions for the Day of Atonement, which are found in Leviticus chapter 16, are far more extensive than those for any of the other feasts. And because of the length of that passage, I'm, I'm not going to read it in its entirety this morning, but I certainly encourage all of you to do that on your own, maybe tonight or sometime this week. But for time's sake, what I'm going to do is summarize some of the most significant aspects of the feasts that were prescribed by God himself. You see, once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would engage in a prescribed series of purification rites and sacrifices. He would begin by taking part in a washing and then put on the priestly garments. After that, he would come before the people with a bull and a ram and two goats. He would sacrifice the bull to atone for his own sins and also the sins of his household. He would take some of the blood of the ram inside of the Holy of Holies and literally sprinkle it on the altar. And he would then exit the Holy of Holies. Next. Two identical goats were brought before him, and the high priest would cast lots on these goats. One goat would be designated the goat for the Lord, and the other the Azazel, which in Hebrew means the scapegoat. The goat that was chosen by Lot for the Lord was then killed by the high priest and then he re-entered the Holy of Holies after washing again and putting on clean priestly garments. He would re-enter the Holy of Holies in order to sprinkle some of the blood on the altar to atone for the sins of all of Israel. 
And after that, the other goat, the one chosen for Azazel, was brought before the high priest who would lay his hands on the goat as the goat faced the assembly of Israel, and he would confess the sins of Israel on the goat, in a way symbolically placing all of Israel's sins on this animal. The goat was then released into the wilderness to symbolize that God had carried away the sins of the people until the ceremony was repeated the following year. By the way, as an aside, if you read some of the commentaries of the scripture, whether it's the Talmud or the Midrash or the Mishnah, which are all commentaries of the word of God, some of the historical commentaries say that they would actually tie a red ribbon on the horns of this scapegoat, this Azazel, and as it would be led off into the wilderness, the red ribbons would turn white. But they said that this only occurred until 40 years before the destruction of the second temple in Israel, which was destroyed in the year 70 AD. So after 30 AD, the red ribbon would not turn white. Why? Because the sins of the people had already been laid on Jesus, and that particular sacrifice was no longer needed. By the way, this is the only time that anyone <clears throat> was ever permitted inside of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later in the temple. Only the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, could go behind the veil which separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. And even he could only do it once a year on the Day of Atonement. The historians tell us that the long robe that the high priest wore on this day had bells on the hem. They also tell us that what they would do is they would tie a rope around the high priest's waist. And as he would go into the Holy of Holies, they would let the rope out. And if the bells from the high priest walking around doing what he needed to do stopped ringing, they knew something was wrong. And they weren't going in to find out why. Now, praise God, they never had to pull him out. But it's an interesting commentary on the tradition. Now, as you would expect, with the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, the Jewish people have had to greatly modify, if you will, the way they observe this feast. Why? Because they can no longer do the prescribed sacrifices. In modern rabbinical Judaism, sin is now atoned for through prayer and repentance and good works and good deeds. And many of the practices that have been adopted are in fact related to this verse in Leviticus 16, verse 29. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. Notice the word the words, afflict yourselves, afflict yourselves. Now, that exact phrase is only used five times in the Bible, and every time it refers to the Day of Atonement. You see, the idea here is one of humbling yourself before God, afflicting your soul, opening yourself up, and humbling yourself before a holy God. And by the time of the Second Temple, what happened was this had evolved into the practice of fasting and also denying yourself physical needs. So today, the Jewish people participate in a complete fast, not even drinking water, for a 25-hour period that begins at sunset on the day before the feast and ends at nightfall on Yom Kippur. There are other additional restrictions, such as not wearing cosmetics or leather shoes. They've all become very traditional though not absolutely biblical. And most of the day is spent in the synagogue in prayer. 
In Orthodox synagogues, services begin early in the morning. Early in the morning, usually around 8 o'clock. And they continue straight through to about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And then people either walk home, go for an afternoon nap, or they go somewhere in the synagogue and rest. And they continue that rest until about 3 p.m. And then people usually come back at 5 or 6 p.m., both for the afternoon service and for the evening services, which continue all the way until sundown. Now, in rabbinic teaching, the Day of Atonement is also considered to be the day on which God's individual judgment on each person is sealed. And remember, I'm talking about Jewish tradition. I'm not talking about biblical truth. On Rosh Hashanah, according to Jewish tradition, each person's name is assigned to one of three groups. One of three groups. There's the righteous. Those are the ones who had their names written in the book of life already because they did such a wonderful job the year before. Then there is the wicked. Those are the ones who had had such a terrible year, a sinful year, an idolatrous year, that their names had already been blotted out from the book. And they were appointed to death. In the, and those in between, that's the third group, who had an additional 10 days before the Day of Atonement to repent, to beat their chest, to ask for forgiveness, and to be counted among the righteous. But on the Day of Atonement, according to the Jewish tradition, judgment was considered to be sealed once and for all. The Yom Kippur services end with a ceremony called Ne'ilah, which pictures the closing of the gates of heaven. That part of the service ends with a final blast of the shofar, a final blast of the trumpet, which indicates that the opportunity for repentance has ended and that each person's judgment has been sealed. When I read that part of my people's tradition, I get very sad. Because you see what it says is on Yom Kippur, you are sealed, if you're righteous, for another year in the book of life. But then you have to do it all over again. And then all over again. And then all over again. And the people who have had a wicked year, they're sealed out of the book of life for another year. Praying, I guess, that they make it to the next year. Dear ones, praise God, isn't it wonderful that our Messiah has made atonement once and for all, for all who believe. Now, also during the day of Yom Kippur, it's not surprising that the book of Jonah is read. You see, it serves as a, as a text for the afternoon service on Yom Kippur. And since the theme of Jonah is repentance and God's forgiveness for all those who genuinely repent, it reinforces many of the themes uh, that I've already highlighted. Let's talk about how the holiday has fulfilled by our Messiah. It's been an interesting week for me as I've gone back and, and studied a lot of the prophetic implications of this day. God has used that time, if you will, to give me some more clarity uh, about the timing of many of the end time events that we see revealed both in the Hebrew Scriptures through the prophets and also in the book of Revelation. But at the same time, it's also been a little frustrating. Frustrating because it's almost impossible to narrow down what I'm going to try to tell you in the short time that we have together this morning. And once again, my prayer is that this will just whet your appetite in order for you to search out these things uh, on your own. Okay. So there are two main aspects of the way Jesus fulfilled and will fulfill this feast. And I want to comment briefly on the past fulfillment, and then we're going to spend most of our time this morning on the future fulfillment. Okay, at his first coming. The entire text of chapters 8 and 9 of the book of Hebrews deals with how Jesus fulfilled the Day of Atonement at his first coming. You see, the passage reveals that the tabernacle and later the temple, as well as the sacrifices made on the Day of Atonement, were merely meant to be a picture 
a picture, a foreshadow of how Jesus would more perfectly provide a way for our sins to be covered and for us to be reconciled to God. And since we can't even begin to look at the entire passage this morning, I picked out a couple of verses that summarize very well, I believe, the overall theme of that scripture passage. Hebrews 9, verse 11 and 12. But when Messiah appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and the more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the Holy of Holies, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. You see, Jesus is not just our high priest. He's also our amazing sacrifice. Think of it. Both of the goats involved in the day of atonement sacrifices are pictures of Jesus. The goat designated for the Lord clearly pictures the blood of Jesus, which was shed on our behalf in order to atone for our sins. But the goat designated for Azazel, the scapegoat, is also a picture of what Jesus did for us as he carried our sins away into the wilderness where they were never returned, kind of like the psalmist describes for us in Psalm 103, verse 12. Quote, God, through Messiah, has removed our sin as far as the east is from the west. But unlike the Day of Atonement, which had to be observed year after year after year, Yeshua, Jesus' death on the cross, made atonement for our sins once and for all, just as the writer of Hebrews confirms at the end of chapter 9, chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly, eagerly waiting for him. This verse, I think, is probably a great segue into what is the primary focus for me this morning, because it refers to the time when our Messiah will return, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And so in that regard, let's look at how Yeshua, Jesus, will fulfill the Day of Atonement at his second coming. Now, the language that clearly refers to the Day of Atonement occurs frequently throughout the Hebrew Scriptures and the prophets. It's when they are writing about the end times, the, the latter days. And there are numerous references to sprinkling that refer the blood of the goat that was sprinkled on the altar on the Day of Atonement by the high priest, and Paul provides us with a good framework for all these passages in his letter to the church at Rome. Romans 11, verses 25 to 27. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now, I think the purpose of the age of the Gentiles, which is synonymous with the church age, is to make Israel jealous so that she will one day return to God and be saved. And the Bible is clear that there will be a day in the future when that will occur. It's clear throughout the scriptures that time is clearly connected to this day of atonement. I want you to notice in this passage that Israel will be saved when Jesus returns to take away their sins. Now, one word of caution before I go on. When Paul writes here in Romans eleven twenty six 26 that all Israel will be saved, it's clear from the surrounding context of the passage and as well as from the rest of the Bible, that he's only referring here to those who by faith have accepted Yeshua, Jesus, as their Messiah. This will become quite clear 
in other passages that we're going to look at. Now, the event is described by a number of Old Testament prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Daniel, for example. And we see hints of it in Joel and Amos. But it is Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, who I believe paints the most complete picture. And I want to begin with this passage, Zechariah chapter 12, verses 8 to 10. On that day, the Lord will protect the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the feeblest among them on that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord going before them. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they'll mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one who weeps over a firstborn. You see, according to Zechariah, there will come a day in which God will pour out his spirit on Israel so that they will recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And they will mourn over the fact that as a people, they were like the rest of us responsible for shedding of his blood. You see, we find that both Jesus and John both refer to such, a, to such an event as well. This is from Matthew chapter 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and with great glory. So, although as followers of Jesus, I think that we often picture the return of Jesus as a time of great joy, Jesus himself made it clear that this would be a time of mourning. The morning seems to be clearly connected to the words of Zechariah, the words that explain the reason for our mourning, and it will be the role of the crucifixion of Jesus. And every one of us, every one of us, whether Jew or Gentile, is responsible for the shed blood of Jesus, which was necessitated by our sins. Revelation 1.7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Again, this verse, like almost every verse in Revelation, has roots in the Hebrew Scriptures. And in this case, it's in the words of Zechariah. And although the focus is primarily on Israel here, there is still the sense that all of us have pierced Jesus because he also died for our sins. So, if you've been paying close attention so far... The logical question you should be asking now is, how do we know that the events described by Zechariah are connected with the Day of Atonement? Well, certainly there's the overall theme of atonement that runs through these verses. But just a few verses later, at the beginning of chapter 13, we find a more direct connection. This is Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. On that day... There shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Zechariah is still referring here to the same day that he described back in chapter 12. And I believe that his audience would have clearly understood that this was a reference to the Day of Atonement since that was the only method by which the sins of the people could be, could be cleansed. There's a clear connection between the Feast of Trumpets and the return of Jesus. But just as there is a 10-day period between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement for the purpose of repenting and turning to God, there will also be some events which occur between the return of Jesus and the time when Israel will return to God and be saved. Zechariah continues in chapter 13, and he describes these events in verses 8 and 9. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one-third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire, and refine them as one refined silver, and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. 
I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. This period between the return of Jesus and the salvation of Israel, it's going to be a time of testing and a time of refining. This is certainly consistent with what we see in Joel and what we see in Amos and what we see pictured even in the account of Noah. The purpose of tribulation is to identify the righteousness of Jesus. And that is clearly what's occurring here. And the result is that only one third of the people of Israel are going to pass the test that day and say, the Lord is my God and be recognized by God as his people. It is that one third that Paul is referring to in Romans when he writes that all Israel will be saved. So what are the implications for us? But rather than leave you with several principles, I'm going to share just one principle with you. But it is a principle that has three distinct aspects. You know, as a preacher, we've always got to do things in threes. Right, Greg? It has three distinct aspects that I'll cover individually, and then I'll come back and tie them all together. One, we need to approach God on his terms. Not on our terms, but on his terms. We've just seen how detailed all the instructions concerning the observance of the feast were, especially in Leviticus 16. And what is really apparent out of all that detail is that it was God and God alone who determines the means by which we must come to him and be saved. But we now live in a day, unfortunately, where we're told, constantly told, that there's many, many ways to God, and that we can just choose whichever path we want. In a well-publicized television show, 2008, Oprah Winfrey, the prophet of the unconscious, (laughs) without a doubt the most popular advocate of that approach, said, among other things, this quote, quote, there are many paths to what you call God. Huh. If it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. There couldn't possibly, she said, be just one way. Moses and Aaron, you know, they didn't sit down and devise a means by which their sins and the sins of the people might be atoned for and then present it to God for his approval. It just doesn't work that way. That would have been ludicrous. But that is exactly what Oprah and every other person who thinks they can choose their own way to God are doing. In effect, they're playing God. When God gave Moses and Aaron the instructions about how to atone for their sins, it couldn't have made a whole lot of sense to them, really. But they didn't argue with God. They didn't present them with their own plan. Or they didn't go on their own way. They just obeyed God. And frankly, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me that the way I'm made right with God is because Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago and came back to life. I mean, that's certainly not how I would have chosen to do it. How about you? But I'm not God. Praise God. So I just have to be obedient to him when Jesus speaks and says this in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one Can you say that with me? No one comes to the Father except through me. But even those of us who have been made right with God on his terms, through faith in Jesus, still have a tendency to try to approach God on our own terms, both individually and corporately. I mean, how often do we make our own plans and then we bring them before God and ask him to bless them? You don't have to raise your hands. Or we decide what we think we need or want. And then we go to God and ask him to provide us with those things. Which brings us to the second principle or application. It all requires repentance. It requires repentance. We throw the word repentance around a lot. I mean, perhaps the most common picture that we use to describe repentance is to make a U-turn, usually in connection with our sin. And there's nothing wrong with that because when we sin... At least part of the process of repentance is to not only be sorry for that sin, but to make a U-turn back to God and not continue in that sin. 
But when you think about it, repentance is really a lot broader than that. In the Hebrew Scriptures, the primary Hebrew word for repent, when it deals with man's repentance, is a word that means to turn back, to shuva, or to return. And it's always in the context of turning back or returning to God. We see that in connection with both the Feast of Trumpets and with the Day of Atonement. Now, you may not know, but for the 30 days of the month of Elul prior to the Feast of Trumpets, the Jewish people spend that time searching out God and hopefully returning to him. And then the primary focus of the 10-day period between the Feast of Trumpets and Yom Kippur is also to repent and to turn back to God. This concept of repentance, I think, is developed a whole lot more fully in the New Testament scriptures. The Greek word used there is a compound word, and it literally means to perceive afterward. And it came to mean to change one's mind. And while the term certainly applies to our sin, I believe actually it has a much broader meaning. It signifies a change in our thinking. A change in our thinking. From being self-centered to being God-centered. It is the process that Paul described in this well-known passage from Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed, shaped by this world, but be transformed. The word there is metamorphosis, from the inside out. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the perfect will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. True repentance means that I change my mind and that I view everything from God's perspective rather than my own. It means that I see sin from his perspective, not my perspective. It means that I deal with sin according to his plan, not my plan. And it means that I need to adjust my life to his word, not his word to my life. Let me repeat that. It means that I need to adjust my life to his word and not adjust his word to my life. And that leads to the third aspect of application. All of this needs to be practiced continually. Continually. It's interesting that the Jewish people still read the book of Jonah in connection with the Day of Atonement every year. And I think that's because this account demonstrates the principle so clearly. You see, when Jonah went into Nineveh and preached, the people repented, at least for the moment, and as a result, God postponed his judgment on them. But it wasn't long, not long at all, until the people returned to their own ways. They no longer saw the need for repentance, and in 612 BC, the Babylonians attacked Assyria and completely destroyed Nineveh. My dear ones, repentance must be an ongoing process. When Paul commanded us, not to be conformed to the world and to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, he used present tense imperative words. And this has a double significance for us. First, the verbs are imperatives. They're imperatives. That means they're commands, not options. And secondly, and more significantly to this aspect of, of this application, they are present tense Verbs, which as we've seen many times before, indicate a continuing action. We could accurately translate the passage kind of like this. Don't keep being conformed to this world, but be constantly being transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, this process of changing our mind and making it God-focused is not a one-time event. It needs to be a lifestyle. So how do I do that in practical terms? Well, how do I approach God on his terms, which requires repentance and practice continually? I think we do it very simply. By saturating our lives with his word, being obedient to the commands of Jesus. And I'll close with this scripture, John 14, verse 21. Our Messiah said, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Let's pray.
Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, 